So hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Sight and Sound Bites webinar. Today's topic is tinnitus treatment options to audiology and beyond. Our speaker today is Dr. Lori Zatelli. She's the managing audiologist in the UPMC Department of Audiology. So as you know, the IENIR Foundation hosts our Sight and Sound Bites webinars every month featuring different topics related to vision loss, hearing loss and disorders, head and neck cancer, sinus allergy, balance disorders, et cetera. Um, and we're thrilled to be doing this topic today. My name is Carrie Fogel. I'm the Senior Director for Development and Foundation Relations at the IENIR Foundation, and I'll be moderating today's webinar and Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder, we're not going to be using the chat function during the webinar, but we ask that you submit your questions to the question and answer Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And following the presentation by Dr. Zatelli, I will moderate the Q&A portion of the program with the questions that are asked during the presentation. Uh, we do ask that you keep your questions general about the presentation and not about personal specifics that might not be relevant to the larger audience. Um, you can feel free to submit your questions at any time throughout the program and we'll make sure to ask them. Um, but if there are any questions that we, for whatever reason, don't have time to answer or are more personal in nature, we will send those to Dr. Zatelli and get answers back to you uh, via email. Um, and following the presentation in a day or two, there will also be a taping of the video today um, on the IENIR Foundation website. So um, now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Zatelli. Dr. Zatelli, Lori Zatelli, joined the UPMC Audiology Department in 2012, and she became the Managing Audiologist in 2021. She received her clinical doctorate in audiology from Pitt's um, program, where she is also an adjunct instructor. Her special interests include evaluation and treatment for tinnitus and decreased sound tolerance, amplification, clinical education, clinical research, and interventional audiology. Uh, she's an active member of the American Academy of Audiology, and she also enjoys volunteering for this organization and also at our Mission of Mercy events that we now participate in every year. So thank you, uh, Lori, Dr. Satelli, for being here. Uh, I will turn over the presentation to you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here with you this afternoon, and I'm pleased to be invited to speak with you about tinnitus today. I hope you find the information that I'm going to share to be helpful. So as, as Carrie mentioned, I'm Lori Zatelli. I work at UPMC in the Department of Audiology and also at the University of Pittsburgh, where I am teaching a newish course on the evaluation of tinnitus and sound intolerance for the AUD students. So just doing my part to spread um, awareness and, and knowledge of that for the students as well. I did at attend the tinnitus retraining therapy um, program with the Yastroboffs, who are the people who created our the training program that we use back in 2013. And since that time, I've been heading up our tinnitus program at UPMC. I'm a certificate holder in tinnitus management as well. Um, and I've recently been invited to chair the committee that's updating the tinnitus practice guidelines for the American Academy of Audiology. So I'm in deep with tinnitus and I really wouldn't have it any other way. So I'm really happy to be here to talk to you a little bit today about some of the things that we do in our clinic. And then some of the other things that a lot of people pursue kind of in conjunction with what we offer that can, can help beyond what we do. So I wanna start by talking a little bit about tinnitus just in general. Um, and when we say tinnitus, which I briefly just want to mention, it's acceptable to say tinnitus or tinnitus, either way is okay. We are referring to a perception of sound that doesn't have any activity in the cochlea. So there's no vibrations that are, that are corresponding with this perception. Um, and there's no right or wrong way to describe your tinnitus because everyone perceives it differently. So some people describe it as a ringing sound. Um, some people might say it sounds like buzzing, hissing, chirping, or other things. So while everyone might have a different tinnitus perception, a lot of people describe their tinnitus as a high pitch sound. So when we try to match pitch, pitch and loudness of people's tinnitus, it's common to find that, um, especially when they have a hearing loss, the, the pitch that they match their tinnitus to is a higher pitch, um, which would be something like birds chirping or a flute sound, things like that on, on that end of the pitch spectrum. So we don't know exactly where tinnitus comes from um, in the brain, and I think that is one of the things that makes it most difficult to evaluate and treat. It kind of makes it this nebulous thing that I think sometimes we just don't have 
completely satisfying answers for. Um, although I will say we know a lot more about it than we used to. There were a lot of early theories that were looking at where tinnitus was coming from, and they were focusing on the, the hearing system, the outer part of the hearing system, which would be the ears. Um, but then after doing some research, they found out even when you cut the hearing nerve, tinnitus is not eliminated. So some of the next theories that are trying to think about where tinnitus is coming from focused on more central activities, things in the brain. And most people now really believe that even when there's damage to the ear or the peripheral system, tinnitus probably is originating in the central auditory system. So there are definitely brain components of it. We have been able to identify several risk factors um, as things that contribute to the likelihood of developing tinnitus or other conditions. Um, so in the case of tinnitus specifically, um, hearing loss and noise exposure are absolutely things that we can link to tinnitus. So um, people who are exposed to hazardous levels of noise tend to be people who are, for example, musicians, um, dentists because of the drilling, construction workers, hunters, service members, veterans, um, just because they tend to be around loud levels of noise and or for prolonged periods of time. We do know that certain medications put people at risk of experiencing hearing loss and tinnitus. There are really three big categories that we think of um, being aminoglycoside antibiotics, um, certain chemotherapy agents, the platin-based ones, and loop diuretics. Depression is closely associated with tinnitus. We're gonna come back to that in a couple minutes. Stress is a well-known factor associated with tinnitus and um, the research absolutely shows that the greater the stress level, the greater the possibility of tinnitus and the greater the intrusiveness of tinnitus. And then lastly, the prevalence and the severity of tinnitus are known to increase with age. So when we think of the population of people who have tinnitus, we can kind of categorize them in different ways. And one way is to sort people according to how bothered they are by their tinnitus. Or another way to, to talk about that is how severe is their self-perceived handicap? How much of their life does it impact? So when you look at the data that are available, actually there are a lot of data to say that most people who have tinnitus are not significantly bothered by it. So we can estimate that there's about 50 million Americans who have tinnitus and approximately three quarters of them, or the 70% represented by the dark red portion of the pie on the screen, are people who experience tinnitus or consider it to be a small problem at worst. So when you, when you talk about this group of people, it tends to be the people that when you say, do you have any ringing or buzzing in your ears? They're like, oh yeah. And that's kind of the end of it. People who um, seek medical treatment or consider tinnitus to be a moderate problem, account for about 20% of the population. So 20 to 25%, that's the light red portion of the pie. And then people who are debilitated by their tinnitus or consider it to be a big problem or a severe problem would be the remaining six to 7%. Um, so you could see the majority of people who have tinnitus don't suffer from it. Um, and really a lot of our treatment goals focus on moving people from a category where they're bothered by their tinnitus into a category where they're not bothered by it. Um, so this is just another way to look at it. It's from another source, and it kind of gives you the same information. Most people who have tinnitus are not bothered by it, and we want to move people into that category if they are bothered by it. So our clinic uses a program called tinnitus retraining therapy. I'll briefly talk about this a little bit. Um, it's similar to some of the things I talked about on the previous session, and then we'll move into some other areas that are kind of adjacent. Um, so this program was established more than 40 years ago by Dr. Powell and Margaret Jastroboff, or they say Yastroboff. I'm used to saying Yastroboff because that's the way I see it in print. Um, so you'll see pictured here on the slide, little baby Lori Zatelli 10 years ago at the training in Maryland in their clinic um, with the two, the doctors Yastroboff. Um, they have a training program where audiologists can go and be certified to do this type of um, treatment. And it's based on the idea that tinnitus only becomes bothers to, bothersome to someone when parts of their brain that should not be activated become activated. So these are things that generate your emotions, you know, generating negative re reactions to tinnitus like fear or anger or frustration, things like that. And then your body actually has a reaction as well. So when you have a negative emotional reaction, it activates things like your heart rate will increase or your muscles will tense up or you'll be kind of in a state of alertness. So the goal of the program and the goal of many, many programs is to facilitate what we call habituation. And we're gonna come back to that in a minute. So research, there's been a lot of research about this approach over the years, and it's shown that in most people, it, it is effective and it helps them to move in the direction that we want them to move. 
So I mentioned habituation. So the this is a very common treatment goal for people with tinnitus because for most people with tinnitus, we can't give you a pill or do a procedure that's going to eliminate it, right? So we want to move you in a direction of becoming less bothered by it and making it less noticeable. So habituation is the process of repeatedly exposing yourself to something um, and over time decreasing your response to it. So in other words, when you're exposed to something over a long period of time, if it doesn't have any negative meaning to you, your brain will kind of tune it out because your brain just knows, oh, I don't need to pay attention to this. And that becomes much easier to do over time with repeated exposure. So here are some examples briefly. So one example of habituation is the feeling of your glasses on your face, if you wear them regularly, or the feeling of your uh, watch on your wrist. Additionally, um, you have all likely habituated to the sight of your nose. <laughs> so it's not something that you generally walk around looking at or thinking about, but whenever I draw your attention to it, you'll be like, oh yes, I do see that when I look for it. Your brain tunes it out because it's not worth the effort to, to look for it when it's constant and unimportant. Um, the sound of your refrigerator running in the background is something that's fairly easy to habituate to for most people, as is the smell of a candle in a room. Um, so the, the longer you're in the room, generally, the less you, type, you tend to notice that kind of thing. So it is even possible to habituate to things that you might really have difficulty imagine. So you hear stories about people living in Chicago directly near the L train who just over time stop noticing it because it's something that they experience so frequently. You know, when you hear something a million times a day, your brain just becomes uninterested in listening for it and doesn't want to devote energy to it. So the goal is to move tinnitus into that category. And we do that using a combination of education and sound therapy. Um, so the majority, although some tinnitus um, can be medically managed, the majority can't. Um, so even if the doctor says to you, oh, there's nothing that we can do to fix your tinnitus, it doesn't mean that no one can help. And education is one of the things that we can do that really is helpful for people. So by working with an audiologist to get the appropriate education, you really empower yourself to move toward acceptance and um, learning how to cope with it and make it less noticeable for you. So when we do these things and have these conversations, we, we talk about all the things that you see on the screen here that I've kind of briefly summarized for you already. The second component of tinnitus retraining therapy is sound therapy. So if the overarching goal is to make the tinnitus less intrusive or less noticeable, one really good way to do that is by using sound in your environment. So there are a lot of different ways that you can provide sound therapy to someone, including masking, which is covering the tinnitus with another sound, um, using soothing noises that are, that are designed to kind of promote calming and develop positive associations, pro providing contrast reduction. So if you think of, this is my favorite example of this, if you walk into a, um, a, a room that has a light on and there's a candle in the corner, you're probably not going to notice it because the overhead light is on. When you turn the light off, the candle seems very bright. And it's not that the candle has changed. It's just that the stimulus around the candle has changed. So there's a bigger contrast. So when you have tinnitus, if there's no noise in your environment, it's going to seem very noticeable. And then when you in increase the um, sound level of the, the background, it just doesn't stick out as much. Um, using distracting noises to kind of um, shift your attention away from the tinnitus, again, ultimately, hopefully resulting in habituation. So if you want to be evaluated for tinnitus, the appropriate first thing to do is schedule with an ear, nose, and throat physician. You'll get a physical exam and a hearing test on that day, likely in the same clinic. And then if there's no medical management that's going to be appropriate, they'll refer you to something, someone like me. So throughout the presentation, you'll see some black and white pictures that look like this. These are, they're called QR codes. That's essentially, it's a link in a visual format. So the way to access this is to open your camera app on your smartphone hold it up to the screen, scan the QR code, and then your phone will take you to that web page. So this one will take you to a page uh, with information about UPMC's ENT clinics. And also if you Google UPMC ear, nose, and throat, you, you will find us that way as well. So a good first step is always an evaluation by ear, nose, and throat, because if there's something medically uh, manageable, they would want to do that. Otherwise, there's still plenty of things that you can do. So we talked a little bit about typical treatments for ENT or for tinnitus, meaning, you know, medical treatment through ENT and then in audiology and the things that we offer in the clinic. And now we're going to take a look at some other possible causes of tinnitus and other comorbidities. Um, I think each of which may benefit from different approach, approaches outside of the realm of audiology. So we're going to look at each one of these things in a little bit more detail. So we'll start by thinking about mental health. Um, we know that the prevalence of anxiety and depression is high in people who have tinnitus. So there was a recent systematic review that 
that approximated that about 33% of people with tinnitus have depression. And there's a, about a 45% lifetime prevalence of anxiety disorders in a population with tinnitus. So those are fairly high, um, high numbers. And although we know that there is a link between tinnitus and anxiety and tinnitus depression, we can't necessarily that say that one causes the other, right? It's a little bit like the chicken or the egg, right? So on one hand, it's really easy to see how someone with anxiety might develop a negative reaction to tinnitus fairly easily. And it's also see, easy to see that someone who develops a new onset of tinnitus that's very bothersome might become anxious about it. Um, so we, we can't really say which causes another. All we can say is that there's definitely a link and that when there is anxiety or depression that's not treated, it's a barrier to coping. So something that we always talk about is, um, a, is mental, comorbid mental health disorders and the importance of seeking treatment for it. So we know that when you treat the, the effects of depression and anxiety, your coping skills are likely to improve. And actually there are a few options that are specific to tinnitus. You don't have to do things that are specific to tinnitus, um, but if you wanted to, these are a few things that you can think about. So one option is cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT for short, because in audiology, we love acronyms. Um, CBT is a, a specific type of psychotherapy that aims to change how people think, which is the cognitive part, and what they do, which is the behavior part. So it's been used a lot in research related to chronic conditions like pain, anxiety, depression, insomnia, and it's been adapted to be applied to tinnitus as well. So in order to pursue this type of treatment, a person would work with someone who's certified to provide this type of therapy, usually a mental health provider. So as an audiologist, I can talk about some of these concepts, but I don't have the training necessary to really teach this strategy in its entirety. Um, so this is something that I would refer out for. So this type of therapy is focused on the relationship between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, which are all interlinked and impact each other. So the, this is the way that I like to illustrate it, because I think it's an example that is easy to relate to. So let's say you're sitting at home one evening, um, reading on the couch. It's getting dark outside. You've just kind of settled in. You've got your comfy cushions. You've got a nice glass of wine, a great book, and you're becoming engrossed in your book. And then suddenly here you hear the floorboards in the hallway creaking. Now, I think there are two possible paths that you that this may set into motion. So one possible path would be if you live with your son, whom you're expecting home soon, your thought, the thought that's generated might be, oh, John's home safe. That's good. The emotion that's generated will be positive. He's safe. That's good news. Your behavior is not going to change. You're going to continue to read happily. On the other hand, other thought, other uh, path, if you live alone and are not expecting visitors and it's getting to be nighttime, your, the thought that's generated might be, there's an intruder in my house. The emotion that's linked will probably be something like fear, something negative. Your behavior might be to leap up and run for the door. So that's, a, that's just one example of how there's one action that can lead to two possible thoughts, sets of emotions, and result in different behaviors. So this type of treatment helps people to focus on identifying thought patterns that are not productive, um, dysfunctional, negative, things that happen kind of automatically, and teach you how to replace these patterns with things that are more realistic, less harmful, more productive, um, things that give you better control over your thoughts and lead to more positive associations. Um, and secondly, there's a focus on behaviors that help people to identify these unhelpful um, behaviors that they might have developed and change them, modify them in certain situations. So this is something that has pretty, a pretty wide body of evidence um, to support specifically for the use of tinnitus. So there are a lot of options uh, for people in Pittsburgh and for people outside of Pittsburgh, but within Pittsburgh specifically, um, or anywhere really, you could ask your primary care doctor for a recommendation, or if you want to come to have a consultation with us, we have a list of people in the area that we've been in contact with and we've worked with in the past who we know are familiar with tinnitus. So your, your provider doesn't need to be familiar with tinnitus. Really, that's my job. Their job is to teach you the coping strategies. Um, but there are a lot of CBT providers that, that are familiar with, this, with tinnitus as well. Um, so I also think that, that it's worth mentioning, there is an interesting option available online as well. Um, it's called iCBT, which is Internet CBT for tinnitus. It was developed by Dr. Hashir Azah, who is a well-known tinnitus researcher. And I think it's a nice option for people who prefer asynchronous kind of self-guided care. Um, so there are a series of modules that you're guided through with exercises and kind of homework and 
a schedule. Um, and, and the research actually really supports the use of something like this for people who are interested in that kind of thing. Um, so if you're interested in checking it out, you can scan the QR code or the website is listed here on the slide as well. So you can just go to icbt number four tinnitus.com. Um, so if you wanna go and just at least learn about it, it's worth going to the website and checking it out. There's a lot of good information there. So another option in this realm is called mindfulness-based stress reduction or MBSR for, for short. So this is a treatment program that accepts, um, that, that um, teaches people to promote non-judgmental awareness and acceptance of chronic things. So kind of shooting for kind of similar goals, but getting to them kind of in different ways. So the mindfulness-based stress reduction program incorporates things like meditation, um, yoga, psychoeducational support, and instructions for how to do these kinds of things in your day-to-day -day life. So for example, um, there's an interesting exercise that I came across. That it's called mindfully eating a raisin. And you don't need to do this right now, but this QR code, if you're interested in doing this in the future, will take you to a page that has, has um, instructions for this exercise. It's, it's an interesting way to approach this experience, and it's all about, you know, taking the time to non-judgmentally evaluate the raisin, everything about it, all of your senses, um, you know, imagining that you're experiencing it for the first time. Like, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are you smelling? Um, all of those things. Um, just kind of trying to move people toward the direction of what's happening in the present moment, accepting it non-judgmentally, and it's not good or bad, it just is. Um, so that's kind of an interesting exercise to do if you have the time and, and the interest. Um, there is also a version of mindfulness-based stress reduction focused specifically on individuals with tinnitus. Um, so if you're interested in kind of a more general option, um, UPMC does have an option for this, and here is the, the link that you can go to for that. Um, if you're looking for something that's specific to tinnitus, you have an online option as well. So this was a program that was developed by Dr. Jennifer Gans, who's a clinical psychologist. She specializes in the psychological impact of hearing disorders um, on well-being. And she developed this program that got a lot of, of use during the COVID-19 pandemic when people were stuck at home and were looking for for solutions. And it's a self-guided thing that you can do over a period of about eight weeks. And it's designed to reframe a person's experience with tinnitus that's bothersome. So if you're interested, you can go to the website, which is mindfultinnitusrelief.com um, or scan the QR code on the bottom of the screen. She is a really, really interesting. And I think she has a lot of um, cool perspectives that can really help people to move in this direction. Something that I saw on her website that I, that I liked was you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. So again, it's it's about non-judgmental acceptance of what's what's happening, and um, moving forward with it. So then let's move on to talking about another specific type of tinnitus. So there are types of tinnitus that can be influenced by input from the cervical spine and the temporomandibular area, so your neck and jaw area. This is called somatic tinnitus or somatosensory tinnitus. So there are thought to be um, connections in the brainstem between this somatosensory system and your auditory system, which enables these two systems to interact. So some people will say that they feel like they can modulate or change their tinnitus by doing specific movements of their temporomandibular joint, their head, their neck, their limbs, things like that. So um, in, in general, temporomandibular disorders or TMD um, are thought to be an important risk factor for the development of tinnitus. So you have two temporomandibular joints um, connecting your lower jaw to your skull and they allow your jaw to move in different directions, You know, chewing, sliding side to side, things like that. So if you have dysfunction in that area, it can lead to jaw pain or tenderness, facial pain. Um, it can be referred up as ear pain. You might have difficulty with chewing. Um, you might find that it's difficult to open or close your mouth. You might find that you get a clicking or a grating sound when you're chewing. Um, so as you can see on the screen here, there are a variety of different movements that people have reported modulate their tinnitus. So if you, if you do some of these things like clench your teeth, teeth together, open your mouth, slide your jaw from one side to, to the other, or place, place your um, hand on your forehead and resist pressure in certain directions, um, you may find that your tinnitus changes or stops or sounds different than what you're typically used to. 
Um, so we don't know exactly how many people experience this type of tinnitus, but estimates indicate maybe somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of people with tinnitus might have a somatic or somatosensory component. So if you have noticed that you your tinnitus can be modulated by moving your head or your neck or your jaw, you might have somatosensory tinnitus or at least a component of it. So um, generally, this type of tinnitus is suspected when a person reports at least one of the following things before their tinnitus started. So um, trauma to the head or neck, head or neck or shoulder pain, um, changes in tinnitus that coincide with pain in these areas, um, or intense teeth grinding or clenching during sleep. So there are a few other possibilities, but those are the things that are kind of high up on the list. So what you're seeing on the screen here is just a quick screening that was developed recently from a publication last year. Um, so this is a flow chart and it's supposed to help us to identify people with somatosensory, somatosensory tinnitus with reasonably good accuracy. So the first step is to think about whether you have neck or jaw complaints. So if you don't, you probably don't have somatosensory tinnitus. That's kind of one of the most important components of it. So if you do, let me ask one more question. Next question is, does your tinnitus and your neck or jaw pain, do they increase or decrease simultaneously at the same time? So if the answer is at least some of the time, there's a decent chance that your tinnitus might be somatosensory. So you should definitely contact us um, and start that process of being evaluated. If you're not sure, or if the answer is no, probably the odds are less, um, but it's still worth following up for evaluation, even if this specific thing isn't the thing that you need. So um, if, you, if you think that you might have somatosensory tinnitus, there are a couple of um, different approaches that I think are, are shown to work well together. So first thing is ENT and audiology. It's always a good idea to start it with a new year eval evaluation. There are a lot of things that can cause tinnitus and this is just one of them. Um, and when you have that evaluation, it's worth mentioning your head and neck and jaw complaints just to get that kind of on their radar. Um, next, a dentist. So if you have any TMJ disorders or temporomandibular disorders, you wanna treat them. Um, for So things like jaw, neck stretches, um, spike gu bite guards or splint, uh, medications, things like that might also might all be possibilities. You also want to see a physical therapist. There may be exercise, exercises, relaxation strategies, certain um, manipulations of the cervical spine area that might be helpful. Um, and there are even other things, you know, I've seen research related to um, lidocaine injections, laser therapy, magnet therapy, all these other things. Um, so I think the the bottom line is that the treatment for this is really needing to be something that is personalized for you. So bite splints, CBT can be a component of treatment for TMD as well. I mentioned home exercises and muscle stretching and uh, massaging, I think is one that I didn't mention. And then thermotherapy with moist heat. So these are all things that, are, that have been shown. If you use these things to treat TMD, you're likely to have an, an, an improvement in your tinnitus as well. And the um, study that I cited here indicated that an, on average, 69% of people with these complaints move toward resolution of their tinnitus after treatment. So it's absolutely worth pursuing if, if you fall into this category. Um, okay, so I mentioned that your team should include providers from ENT, dentistry, and PT. Um, so we have a group of awesome physical therapists at the UPMC Rehabilitation Institute who focus on strategies specifically for temporomandibular dysfunction. So it's absolutely worth um, reaching out to them if you feel like this is something that you might benefit from. Um, one other thing I wanna mention before I move on to the next thing is that um, while we're talking about somatosensory tinnitus, there is a device that many of you may have heard of. Um, there's a researcher named Susan Shore uh, who has a, a lab in, at Michigan Health System in Ann Arbor. And she's developed this device that's a biosensory treatment for tinnitus, um, and it's specifically for people with somatosensory tinnitus. So I'm mentioning this now because there was a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association published about 10 days ago that was detailing some of the results of their most recent trial. Um, and the, the results appear to be promising, and it sounds like they are pursuing FDA approval uh, for the device now. So unfortunately, I don't have an expected timeline for this, um, and I'm sorry for that, but we are going to be keeping our ear to the ground for this and, and thinking about what to do whenever it becomes something that becomes available clinically. Okay, moving on to thinking about sleep issues, which are highly prevalent in people with tinnitus. Uh, many people who have tinnitus are bothered by it at night because it's common to want a quiet sleeping environment. So most people notice their tinnitus the most um, in quiet situations where there's no other noise in the background to distract you from it. 
it's really important to use strategies that are going to help you to promote good sleep hygiene so that you're well rested and you hopefully have the best chance of employing all of the coping strategies that you're learning about. Um, so things like um, like you see on the screen here, creating a consistent bedtime routine, making your bedroom a place where sleep is, you know, the thing that happens, making it comfortable. Um, only go to bed when you're sleepy. Um, get out of bed and when you're unable to fall asleep and then come back and try again. So all of the things that you see on the screen here are just, you know, a couple pieces of advice that have recently been published in the hearing journal in, a, in an article that's specific to sleep quality um, and why it's important for people with tinnitus. Also, if you feel like tinnitus or sleep is a significant issue for you, you could consider a formal evaluation of this. So if you follow the QR code here on this screen, you're going to be directed to a page that's going to put you in contact with UPMC's Sleep Medicine Center. Um, so in the meantime, if you're thinking about doing something like this, one thing that you could try is using, aside from good sleeping habits, um, sound to distract your brain. There's not a recommendation for a specific type of sound because what the research supports is that whatever you like is best for you individually. Um, but there are a pretty wide variety of sounds that are available. So white noise, pink noise, nature sounds, music, fractal tones, you know, other day-to-day, -day, you know, daily sounds. Um, there is, I've provided a, a QR code here that will lead you to a page maintained by the American Tinnitus Association that has a variety of free sounds that you can trial, as well as um, listings of different apps that you can try uh, that will give you lots of different choices to choose from and hopefully find the thing that interacts with your tinnitus in the way that you find to be most pleasing. And then lastly, before we wrap, I wanted to just briefly mention another specific type of tinnitus that is rare but possible. Um, it's called tensor tympani syndrome. Um, it is it happens whenever the muscles in your middle ear contract randomly. So it's also called middle ear muscle myoclonus, movements of muscle contractions of the ear. Um, so it's, I would say as a whole, it's not that well understood in the literature. And I would say that there's really a lack of consensus related to how to diagnose it. But what most people who are diagnosed with this report is a sensation of snapping or fluttering or clicking. Um, so that would be different from the typical tonal tinnitus that a lot of people report. So it's, it's different in that way. Um, and if it's happening very rapidly, it might sound like a continuous sound. Um, for a lot of people that they're, they're, it's random, there's nothing that they can do to elicit this or bring it on, which makes it difficult to evaluate in the clinic because a lot of times what we see is it's like when you take your car to the mechanic, it stops making the noise, right? So if you're not experiencing it on the day that we see you in clinic, it's really hard to evaluate. Um, so I mentioned there's a lack of consensus related to um, diagnosis of middle ear muscle myoclonus or tensor tympani syndrome. There's unfortunately also a lack of consensus for strategies for treatment. Um, so there's a pretty modest level of evidence available right now, but generally what people think is there that a, a stepwise approach is best. So starting with something that's kind of the least invasive, um, moving toward whatever might be appropriate for each individual person, kind of thinking about what each person's priorities and circumstances are going to be. So there are some medical options, including things like Botox and medical uh, medications and uh, surgical treatment is also an option, which I don't think is very common. Um, so as, as I mentioned, um, all these decisions are best made on an individual basis and uh, with your ENT provider, who will be the one partnering you for this. Um, so before we wrap, I, I want to make sure that I mention the American Tinnitus Association, which has created a lot of good resources for people. Um, and I mentioned previously before, there's a page of sound therapy options, which is really helpful. But this, what you see on the screen here, is what they call their navigator. So it's designed to help people with, with tinnitus who don't know what to do about it, figure out where to go. Um, and you guys are already way ahead of the game because you're here listening to me talk about this. So this is something that you can share with people if they need help, um, but you already know the best thing to do, which is to connect yourself with us. So my take home today is that uh, there are some types of tinnitus that might be medically manageable, but even if, it, if not, there are many treatment options, um, including all of the things that we've talked about today and even more. Um, so you've got a whole team of people, including audiologists, physicians, mental health providers, primary care physicians, dentists, physical therapists, and others who can all work together to help you treat the tinnitus that you're experiencing, um, no matter what's causing it. So if you want to discuss any of these options, please do not hesitate to reach out with us to us, and we would be happy to uh, have a consultation with you. So if you want to do that, you call our desk at 412-647-2030, and this QR code will take you to the audiology page specifically. 
Um, thank you so much for attending today. I really hope that this was helpful for you. And if there are any questions that I can answer, I would be happy to do so. Thank you so much, Lori. That was great. Um, a lot of really um, helpful, tactical approaches to managing tinnitus, living with tinnitus um, that I think a lot of people will hopefully take home and try and um, you know consult their uh, their primary care doctors, their ENTs to kind of see where they go from here. Uh, if we have patients who are here listening, um, as always, you know the Eye and Ear Foundation is happy to be a resource if you're looking for a connection to our fabulous Department of Audiology, um, and we can talk more about that if you contact us directly. Um, but we do have several questions. I'm anxious to get to them, um, and so I'll just go ahead and start. And I'm sure we'll be getting more as we progress. So first, um, someone is asking about referrals. Can you be referred to the Department of Audiology from neurology, from different departments? How, how do people kind of get in to see you? Absolutely, there are different pathways. So the most common pathway that we see is referrals from ear, nose, and throat. Um, we have a packet of information that outlines how our treatment programs work. And when people are scheduled with ENT for tinnitus, they have their physical evaluation and their hearing tests, and then they're handed the packet and told to contact us. Um, we do see a lot of people that are referred to us from other sources, though. I would say that's the most common, but we definitely see people from the concussion clinic, from neurology, um, from other uh, rehab. Um, disciplines from primary care. Um, so it doesn't really matter how you get to us. We are going to make sure that you have all of the steps uh, completed that you need in order to, to move you through the program. So we, our front desk is trained to help you get all of the components that you need before you move forward. Great. Thank you. Um, you touched on a, a little bit about treatment of anxiety and kind of um, you know, disease acceptance as part of a management strategy. But in terms of pharmaceutical approach to um, treating the anxiety symptoms of tinnitus, is that something that you can speak on or recommend at all? So there, when people use anti-anxiety medications to treat tinnitus, they're not trying to reduce the tinnitus perception itself. What they're trying to focus on is reducing the distress related to the tinnitus. So it's not necessarily that they're, they're giving you the medication to make your tinnitus go away. It's to make you, it's to improve your coping skills and to make it less intrusive. And for many people that is effective. That's a great strategy. Um, you know, that may, that may work for some, some individuals who are feeling that type of distress. Absolutely. Um, and the effect that it has on their lives. So thank you. Um, we have a question about the impact of COVID infections and whether or not they cause or exacerbate tinnitus symptoms. This is something that a lot of people have been looking into over the last couple of years. Um, and in 2021, 22, and the early part of 23, there have been many, many studies that have tried to estimate this. So if you take all of the studies kind of together, um, what you have is an estimate somewhere between zero and 23% of people with tinnitus are gonna develop a new, of people with COVID, I'm sorry, are gonna um, develop a, an onset of tinnitus. That's a pretty wide range. Um, there was a recent study that just kind of pulled everything together and they determined that there's about a 4.5% per, 4 um, rate. So it's definitely something that people have reported to us. Um, and then I, I don't know if this was part of your question or not, but related to the um, COVID vaccines, a lot of people have been asking about that and tinnitus as well. So related to that, um, the CDC maintains a vaccine adverse event um, database where people can report adverse events that they experience after they, they get a vaccine. And the there are people who report tinnitus after a vaccine, but when you compare it to the number of doses that have been administered, it is very, very low, less than 1%. Um, and a recent article that I just read about this indicated that the relationship of tinnitus to other vaccines, like for example, flu vaccine or shingles is higher than, than the COVID one. Um, so there definitely people are thinking about this. And I think part of the, the issue is that a lot of the measures that were employed during the worst of the pandemic were things that tended to exacerbate tinnitus, you know, isolation, 
um, not being able to go out and interact with other people, not being able to do the things that you typically like to engage in, um, those kind of things tend to make tinnitus more noticeable. So um, I, what I'm hearing a lot from my patients are that now that some of those more strict restrictions have been lifted and they're going back to their normal activities, tinnitus is not as intrusive for many of them. I hope that answered your question. It was kind of a long answer. No, I think I think a question like that will warrant like a, a thoughtful answer. Um, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of questions that came in all together just a few minutes ago that I think I'll kind of address kind of as one question. Um, and that's about the impact that a hearing aid, a well-fitting, well-functioning hearing aid um, can have on your experience with tinnitus. And, and I know obviously this is what you know, the Department of Audiology specializes in. So can you talk about the impact that hearing aids can have on the perception of tinnitus um, and, and can it make your tinnitus better? If you Absolutely. Thank you for asking this. So hearing aids are a huge component of, of treatment programs for most people, especially when they have hearing loss. Um, and I say, especially when they have hearing loss, because we, we do still use on-ear devices when people don't have hearing loss. It's just that we don't activate the amplification portion of it. So hearing aids generally can have amplification, which is the, um, the hearing aid part. It can have a tinnitus sound generator, which is the noise that helps to distract your brain from the tinnitus. And then you can also have both components working together at the same time. So you can kind of pick and choose which parts you want to activate or whether you want to do them together. Um, so hearing aids are very helpful for most people with tinnitus. Um, we estimate that the majority of people who have tinnitus have hearing loss, probably about 90% of people. Um, and if you are someone who's never worn hearing aids before and you are a hearing aid candidate and you have tinnitus that's bothersome, you may find that the hearing aids themselves provide you the relief that you need. You know, activating those pathways in your brain, kind of distracting your brain from the noise that it's making up itself. Um, another component of it is reducing the effort that you're using to fill in the gaps of things that you're missing due to your hearing loss. So if you're able to wear hearing aids that are fit appropriately and giving you the, the benefit that you need to do that, you're not working as hard to put together the pieces of the things that you're missing. And that leaves you more cognitive and emotional energy to cope with the tinnitus. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that hearing aids can help with tinnitus. And it's a big part of a lot of the sound therapy um, programs that are out there. That's fantastic. Um, as kind of a follow-up to that question there, you know, people wear hearing aids during the day when they're interacting with, you know, with their life and the world, et cetera. Um, but then at night people remove their hearing aids and then they may be bothered by some of the symptoms related to their tinnitus. Um, someone's asking if there is any way that different types of sound therapy can be used at night during sleep that may cause sleep disturbances um, when you're not able to wear your hearing aids. There are a lot of different options. Um, so if some people do want to wear their hearing aids to sleep and that's fine. And a lot of people don't, or if you have hearing aids that are rechargeable, they need to go in the charging dock sometime, right? So most people would do that overnight. Um, so in those cases, you can use uh, free field sound. If you have something that, that has speakers, you can play sound in your room. A lot of times if there's a bed partner, um, they, we run into situations where one person likes that kind of sound and the other one doesn't. So in that case, you can think about some more personalized solutions. Um, like for example, there's a company called Sound Oasis that makes little speakers that go into your pillow and then the sound is right next to your ear. So it doesn't need to be very loud. Um, they also make whole, whole pillows that have the, the speakers built in. There are also some um, Bluetooth headsets that are, it's like a soft headband that goes around your ear that produces um, sound and it's got a flat speaker in it so that you can wear it with your head laying down on the pillow. Um, so strategies like that are things that a lot of people benefit from that are kind of personalized solutions where they still get the sound, but they don't have to wear their hearing aids or bother other people in the room. So it sounds like there are some uh, fun new sleep accessories to help people that are on exactly. the market. I like to look at it like that too. Yeah, um, I, I, I do as well. Um, so moving on from that a little bit, um, someone's asking if caffeine or alcohol consumption can affect tinnitus one way or another. There are many people who feel that it does. Um, so specifically people who have 
a condition called Hydrops or Meniere's disease really feel like salt, caffeine, um, alcohol, things like that interfere with or interact with their tinnitus. So some people will say, I keep track of what I eat because if I have you know, a little bit of salt, I notice it the next day, my tinnitus is more noticeable. Um, and in that case specifically, it's, it's thought to have to do with the concentration of fluid in your inner ear. Um, and it's tr often treated with things like diuretics. So things like salt and caffeine and alcohol can um, interfere with that ratio. So not everybody notices that, but some people feel like they notice an improvement when they cut back on those kinds of things. Interesting, thank you. Um, we have a question about ototoxicity, and, and that's something we hear about um, a lot of times related to different types of medical treatment and the effects of that treatment. Sometimes mm -hmm. like chemo radiation, as you know, those treatments can be ototoxic. Other medical treatments can be ototoxic. Um, do you find that if there is an a, a treatment or a drug that someone takes, if it's a drop or any type of prescription medication, does that contribute to tinnitus at all? Can you speak a little bit about ototoxicity and tinnitus? Often the effects of ototoxic medications are dose dependent. So that means the high, the more concentrated or higher the dose, the more of an more of an ototoxic impact it will have. So ototoxic means it's it's poisonous to the hair cells essentially. Um, so. I think a lot of times if you're in a situation where you're being put on a medication that is known to be ototoxic, there is a reason for it and you have to work with your physician to balance that. Um, so the most important thing I would say if you're in that kind of situation is to connect yourself with an audiology department so that we can monitor your hearing and manage any changes as they occur and be in close connection with your physician that's, um, that's treating you so that they're aware of if changes are occurring and how fast and, and to what degree. Um, so sometimes you don't have too much of a choice um, based on what they're treating you for and what they're using to do it. So the best thing to do is connect yourself to audiology. We can, you know, there, there's, we can help pretty much anyone. You know, if you have no hearing at all, we can still help you. So definitely wanna get connected to us and make sure that you stay connected throughout the course of your treatment. So this is something we, um, the Ioneer Foundation is also interested in learning about on the research side of the Department of Otolaryngology um, mm -hmm. and whether or not there are any genetic components that might make someone predisposed to acquiring bothersome tinnitus. I read a semi-recent article about this, maybe from about two, one or two years ago. Um, that was looking at whether there was a genetic component to tinnitus. And what they found was that if the tinnitus is bilateral, meaning that it's in both ears, there may be a hereditary component. If the tinnitus is unilateral in one ear, it's more likely to be an environmental cause like loud noise or something or traumatic injury or something like that. Um, but if it's bilateral, there is a chance that it could be hereditary. That's interesting. And I imagine, you know, as genetic work is being is more and more popular in scientific research, we'll learn a lot more about the genetics of tinnitus. You know, I think so too. Yeah, looking looking for specific biomarkers and things like that. I think we'll start to see more of that as well. Absolutely, um, and that is something we are working on here at, at Pitt, I believe. Um, we have someone asking uh, if there are any programs for the management of hyperacusis, and is there a program at UPMC or affiliated that would that would help with that condition? Yes, that's us. Um, so the program that we use is called tinnitus retraining therapy, but within that program, there are different protocols that we can use for tinnitus and sound intolerance. So we would divide sound intolerance into two categories, one being hyperacusis, the other being misophonia. Hyperacusis is an aversion to sounds based on the physical characteristic of the sound. Misophonia is an aversion to sound based on the context of the sound um, and the previous learned experiences with it. And um, we do a series of tests to try to help us sort out what you're experiencing. And then we develop a treatment plan that's specific to you. So there are treatment protocols for both. Um, and there are ways that we move people toward um, higher levels of tolerating sound. So that's us. Same place, give us a call, 2030 number. There you go. 
Um, I think we've got about two more and then I think we'll wrap it up. And if there are a couple of personal questions here that we will um, send to Dr. Zatelli here after the program and uh, she may be able to provide a more tailored response to those. Um, but the last one is about eustachian tube spasms and if that's something mm -hmm. you know of and how it correlates to tinnitus. So there, there are some tests that we can do related to eustachian tubes. A lot of times it has to do with either the tube um, closing when it shouldn't or staying open when it shouldn't. Um, I would say if this is something that you're worried about experiencing, this is definitely an ENT follow-up. Um, although I'm wondering if what you're experiencing is related to the um, myoclonus that we mentioned as well, because all of those things are kind of related. So it's Eustachian tube spasm is not something that's at the top of my mind when I think of causes of tinnitus, but it sounds like it's worth an ENT eval, especially if you're experiencing pressure or fullness or anything like that. Thank you. I think that will be helpful. Um, and finally, uh, we have a question about um, kind of the age at which point some people start experiencing tinnitus. Is this something that is onset mm -hmm. with age? Can it happen spontaneously in your younger, you know, kind of what is the trajectory for someone, you know, who may not have tinnitus now, but knows people in their family who experience it? How does it correlate with age? Age is a risk factor for tinnitus. Um, that being said, there are ch children who experience tinnitus as well. It's interesting if you look at some of the literature related to that, um, a lot of times children don't know that they're experiencing tinnitus unless someone specifically asks them about it. Like they don't know that it's abnormal or they think it's something that everybody hears. Um, and a lot of times they don't react to it until they see a negative reaction from a family member or a physician or something like that. Um, so there, there are definitely children who have tinnitus. I would say it's probably not something that's talked about as much in, in a pediatric population, um, but something to think about um, going back to the age being risk factor thing is that hearing loss is also something that, that increases over time with age typically as well. Um, so the the more likely, the, the higher the odds of having hearing loss, the more likely you are to develop tinnitus as well. So I think that's probably a component, but yes, def definitely age is a risk factor for tinnitus, um, but people of all ages can have tinnitus. I think that's good to know. Um, and I know everybody probably on this webinar is, is hyper vigilant about monitoring and managing. So we'll continue to do that. And if we run into a problem, we know who to call. Here we are. A great resource right here in our city of Pittsburgh. Um, so I think we'll conclude our program there. We're just about at noon. Um, so I just want to start off by thanking you, Lori, Dr. Zatelli. This was a fantastic program. I know we'll have lots of questions as follow up. So I look forward to talking with you about those. To all of our attendees, thank you very much for spending your lunch hour with us. Uh, I hope you found this informational. And as always, you can reach out to uh, Craig Smith, myself, um, anyone at the Ioneer Foundation, and we'd be happy to uh, put you in touch with anybody at the Department of Audiology relating to tinnitus, um, your tinnitus, if you need that. Um, just again, in a couple of days, uh, transcription and a recording of this program will be uh, available on the Ioneer Foundation website. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. So thank you all again. Uh, please send us any questions. And as always, we hope to see you at our next webinar in a couple of weeks. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.